In the morning of the world, everything seemed infinite. Humanity was a part of it, and the idea of owning a thing seemed absurd. But something happened to separate us from these great commons that we once all shared. Today, we have to think hard to remember what a commons is. The very essence of a commons concept is that no one can own the commons for their own benefit. Okay, they, okay. Okay, that's the significance of it. That means that people can't, you can't carve it up into property rights. That means you can't grandfather your prior emissions because you got there first. There are actual pr practical legal consequences of it being a commons. This is a plaza like so many others in so many places. In the background, you see the old colonial period opera house that's so lovely. Last night on this plaza, there was live music, dining outside and just enjoying the beautiful tropical evening. I saw people praying, as so many do in holy places built on plazas around the world. This is a special place, part of the life of the community. It's a place people expect to go to enjoy each other's company. It's a place where people can find the heart they care about. It's almost a place they can call their community itself. But something happened. Something happened to separate us from the great commons we once roamed. Places of the worlds were commons, from which we got and shared everything. But before we knew it, life became much more complex. The giant forests began to fall. A jungle uh, like it used to be here, a primary jungle, once you cut like this, no less than 300 years for it to grow again, because most of the trees that were here were centenary trees, you know, which I won't see in you. <laughs> Things that we took for granted suddenly became commodities. More mouths to feed, more children to educate. Families wanted a better life. Almost before we knew it, Villages became cities, and suddenly, we forgot that we shared the great common places. It's a windy day at Caracol Beach in Cancun. Now, the interesting thing about this beach is that, as far as I can tell, it is the one and only access point to the beach for about 15 kilometers. Well, I think that we've gotten to the ridiculous extreme of private property where you can have situations, um, just some, some of the ludicrous stories. Um, the American Society of ASCAP, the Composer Society, decided they were going to go after summer camps. They needed to pay royalties when they played, when they sang, Woody Guthrie's This Land is Your Land. Um, you had a situation, um, public schools in Georgia were getting funding from Coca-Cola, and so they had Coke Day. And so, and they were supposed to celebrate Coke. One kid wore a Pepsi shirt on Coke Day, got sent home from school. Perhaps no one has felt the loss of their commons more than the indigenous peoples of the world. I'm here to defend our rights and title in Canada because Enbridge is um, looking to throw a pipeline across our territories 
And now they're bringing the trees, our sacred trees, into this commodification system of the sacred. What yeah. once was mine, I'm the queen of that green she bring it here. And as queen of that green, if they never would have disturbed our nation, i will been queen of this green area. They don't need that bottom, that's a lot I'm the queen of. Queen Chief Warhorse claims title to essentially the entire southern United States. The Commons offers a way for people to take individual responsibility, create collective uh, accountability for uh, mutual benefit. And uh, it's very important that to understand that commons work best, as what we've learned so far, when there are real issues to real people. So we have real farmers in a particular area that need to organize around irrigation, or we have real software developers who are trying to organize with regard to the code they're going to share, or we have neighbors in a city that are really trying to grapple with how they're going to deal with, oh, uh, shared parking spaces, uh, uh, for one thing, uh, as an example. And so it's when people can get together uh, on issues of mutual interest for mutual benefit that require individual responsibility and mechanisms of accountability that are held collectively, they can begin to build an effect, a commons. Now when we take a larger resource, whether it's a forest or as you know, the Gulf of Mexico, as an example with your work, that this becomes more involved. How does this resource have an intergenerational benefit to it, uh, what are all of the issues that would need to be taken into account? And who are all the stakeholders that need to be brought into the room in order to make some binding, lasting agreements that could stand the test of time? And as we do that, as we learn more and more, and as there are legal cases that support this more and more, and we're seeing certain countries attempt to do this. Uh, right now it's uh, almost an anomaly, but we'll see that more and more. Why? Because we're running out of steam. People know we're running out of steam with the current model. Well, it offers a framework for first of all considering what is it that we need in order for us all to move forward with whatever moving forward is. In other words, the, the basic resources that we need for life. So whether we're looking at land, whether we're looking at access to water or electricity or health care or education, um, what, uh, first of all, the commons would hold that we're talking about providing not just for a few and not just for some, but for all, right? We, the commons, we're all commoners. No one's excluded from being a commoner. It's not part of a caste system of any sort. So when we take that as a fundamental principle that whatever the solution set is, and there might be a spectrum of solutions, the least uh, solution has to be workable uh, and everybody has to be included in that. One of the things we've got to come to terms with or kind of grow beyond is we've been operating on some old assumptions that just aren't true. The atmosphere is one of the great global commons. The accelerating damage from climate change has galvanized activists and thinkers worldwide. It seems we can't go back to the way we were, but there's no going forward the way we are. Author Bill McKibben, founder of 350.org, one of the largest global climate activist networks, succinctly describes how we got to the present point with our atmospheric commons. So here's the essential problem. We've allowed, because we didn't know for a long time that carbon dioxide was dangerous, we've allowed oil companies and coal companies to use the atmosphere as a free open sewer into which to dump all their waste. And that's why they're the most profitable industry on earth, because they don't have to clean up after themselves. Any industry would like that deal and any industry would be rich if it was allowed to ignore the public good in that way. 
to claim a public space as its own, okay? The whole fight over global warming is essentially a fight over whether we can get them to relinquish their hold on that space, to make the atmosphere a public space, not a private one, okay? That's what this fight is about. The energy sources that we need to go towards, wind and the sun, are fundamentally local and distributed, not centralized the way things are at the moment. And I think one of the results of that will be that our economies will become steadily more local as time goes on. We already see it beginning to happen with food as this local food movement in the West gathers force. President Evo Morales of Bolivia speaks for many global leaders about the frustration of the international community's inability to negotiate a global climate agreement. The people of the Gulf of Mexico are acutely aware of the damage to their shared ocean commons in the Gulf and its effect on their economy. NOAA, whoever it was, announced that, that there was a record amount of oil flowing into the, into the Gulf 75 miles south of Pascagoula, Mississippi. It, the, our, our business was over. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. Tell me, what's, what's the thinking about the future? What should be done to prevent this kind of thing? In the age of oil, bottom line, get our dependency on oil behind us, find uh, an alternative industry for 75% of the population in South Louisiana. <laughs> this has big implications right now all over the world. People are itching to regain what they believe they have lost. Answers are being demanded in many, many ways. Vestidos de indio, porque tenemos que defender a nuestros indígenas. Ellos son los que procuran la tierra, los que cuidan el agua. International barrister Polly Higgins has suggested using the war crime statutes to punish a new crime of ecocide. Well, I have given it a legal definition. The word itself has, in fact, been around for 30, 40 years, but it's never been legally defined. And I have proposed that ecocide is the damage, destruction to, or loss of ecosystems. Ethicist Professor Don Brown suggests that both ethics and international law offer practical routes forward. The, the atmosphere is, in fact, a global commons. It's understood as part of international law to be to be a global commons. Uh, international law says that no nation can uh, be engaged in transboundary pollution that will cause harm to, to other people. This, this issue called global warming is a, is a symptom of a much larger challenge we face in the next few decades, which is how to fit nine billion people with infinite, infinite aspirations on a finite planet. If you're not dealing with the other energy challenge, which is people who have no access to energy, well, I think Eleanor Ostrom and her colleagues have pointed out numbers of commons of uh, resource-based uh, commons that tend to be on a small scale with uh, irrigation projects, uh, managing rivers, uh, managing fisheries. There are many examples, of course, in the digital commons. So this is really about empowerment of communities. It can be on a really minor scale where you have a tiny island um, or a tiny community, or it can be done on a major scale. We can literally be looking at setting up a Planet Earth Trust and giving it legal validity. One thing that uh, myself and many other climate justice groups are trying to do is bring the voices of those that are most affected to climate, by climate change to the front, to the forefront, and they should be the ones making the decisions, deciding what's going to happen, and have sovereignty over their own, own communities. Right now, this is totally not the case. Here in a dry forest, we're surrounded by organic matter. It's the kind of thing we don't notice and don't really pay any attention to, but it is vital for life on Earth. Because as the saying goes, the top six inches of soil on the planet is what keeps us all alive on land. 
The top six inches of soil is what contains the organic matter that nurtures the bacteria and that holds the fungi. And together, those bacteria and fungi and the tiny life forms in soil are what sequester or hold carbon. This holding of carbon by soil is vitally important because with it, we can grow plants, the ecosystems can thrive, and they produce the ecosystem services we need. These are what hold enough carbon to moderate atmospheric carbon dioxide long enough for it to be stable. That's essential for life on Earth. We've seen what a tiny, tiny change in carbon dioxide concentrations can do in terms of global warming. If we keep healthy soils, if we keep lots and lots of organic carbon in them, they moderate that carbon dioxide and they provide the basic conditions necessary for us and other life forms to thrive. So when we talk about one way of keeping the atmosphere healthy and keeping global warming in check, we're also talking about protecting the soil. But it's also the beginning of a general ecosystem health that's an example for us. Because there is no such thing as waste in a natural system. Every leaf, every bit of root, every bit of beautiful Spanish moss that's fallen to the ground here becomes the food for some other life form. And this is what we can learn from in terms of our economy and our ecosystem. When we treat our commons like an ecosystem, we make sure that value is stored, preserved, and further built up for the benefit of all. The first step in making the commons work is developing a social charter. And a social charter is when a, a group of stakeholders get together and begin to say, well, we have this grievance, but it's not go what our concerns aren't going anywhere because uh, we're not organized and we haven't really fully articulated what the problem is. And let's do that. Let's sit down and create something that declares that we have the right to manage our own commons. You know, what are the, what's the history of the problem? What is, what are the, what's the basis of the claims that we're making? Um, what are our rights in the situation? Um, wh what is our grievance procedure? What, what is our grievance exactly as it uh, pertains to the management by the state and the management by the market, or in this case BP or other corporations, of the, of the resources that really are ours and that we have to live with and we, we manage to the extent that we can. They've been outsourced to the state and the government, but but they're essentially our resources. Can we reclaim them? To what extent is that possible? What re resources can we realistically reclaim? Many ch social charters have been written for forests and land trusts and, and other places, um, and, uh, 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 watersheds and um, fisheries. Uh, so you, you've, got a, you've got a precedent for this, and um, the activists in um, in the Gulf region, rather than keep petitioning the corporations, keep petitioning the gov local governments and the state to do something, um, then they can say, you know, we have to act independently. And their first act is not to sue anybody or to, to uh, take any kind of adverse position, but to just say, let's organize, and on that basis, let's do something independently. And that social charter can be a very powerful tool because ultimately it can become a legal document and you want to become sustainable, then the first question is how do I meet a social need? The second question is how can I, I, on top of that, create new mechanisms that have a different value? And for example, instead of using an interest-based currency, we could use another type of, of currency or a credit commons or you know, something that is more in tune with our, with our own values, right? So you build next to the mainstream economy you build a counter economy or an alternative economy and the aim is to make it stronger and stronger. The third question is there's a lot of things you don't need money for and so you can develop all kinds of practices which go beyond the money economy which will bring you real value like Imagine a world that your grandchildren are going to be living in in 2025. What is it you really want for your grandchildren in 2025. So this notion of the commons is fundamental to, you could say, human freedom. It's fundamental to uh, the health and sustainability of the planet. It's fundamental to the well-being of species altogether. 
And even more important than that, it's fundamental to participating in what we could say is the deepest, most ecstatic part of life in which we can step out of time, so to speak, to participate in uh, the deep joy and peace uh, that accords with being fully alive.